All right, so gang, we're going to come back and uh, we're going to finish wrapping up what we're looking at beyond the Cold War, and then we're going to talk about some limits or checks that um, how foreign policy is made and the, the decision-making process and who influences that decision-making process. And lastly, about how limit um, the checks or limits on foreign policy are for the president. Um, so today, in today's world, obviously our number one concern or one of our number one concerns, main concerns uh, in foreign policy is our, is the war on terror. Um, beginning with the terrorist attacks on 9-11, uh, there were previous attacks. Uh, there was an attack on the USS Cole in the um, Persian Gulf. There were attacks on various embassies, have been attacks on various embassies. Uh, but the most grievous attack was on 9-11 in 2001, September 11, 2001. Um, and that really pushed um, terrorism to the forefront of the U.S. Now, a significant thing to note about foreign policy um, and terrorism is that we have had terrorists within America before. Um, the World Trade Center was not the first bombing. Uh, there were other attacks on the World Trade Center themselves. They were also, um, one was done in the basement attacking one of the support columns or pillars. Uh, but there have also been homegrown terrorists, uh, people that didn't agree with the federal government. Uh, Oklahoma City, uh, one of their federal office buildings was bombed uh, by terrorists from within the United States. But obviously, um, the major face of terrorism today are radical Islamists. Um, and so what we've got to do now is we've got to figure out how to approach these. Um, George W. Bush took a policy uh, being very active in this. And what he believed in was something called a policy of preemption. Um, he believed in attacking people before they could become a threat to us. And that's what led us in 2003 to invade Iraq. Um, it was a policy of preemption. He uh, had Colin Powell, the current the Secretary of State at the time, go speak in front of the UN and, and build his case uh, that Saddam Hussein was making weapons of mass destruction and that we should preemptively go and attack them before they attacked us. Um, and many people make that argument today with Syria. Um, if the Islamic State grows too powerful and gets too big, we should go, uh, before they can do that, we should go wipe them out and take care of them before that. And that's the policy of preemption. And that's really similar um, to George W. Bush's uh, policy during his presidency. Well, he also believed in what became known as neocon democracy. Um, Neoconservatives in the uh, Bush W. era um, believe that, that we would be better off, uh, we would be better served if we spread democracy to those people that did not have it. Um, and that's why that was one of the arguments for why we invaded Iraq to begin with uh, was to install democracy. They had a terrible dictator, uh, violated human rights, attacked people who didn't need to be attacked within his own country. And so we should take him out and replace them. And that was the neocon democracy. Um, and many agree with that today and many don't. Obviously, um, there are people on all sides of the coin of that. Well, the main question facing the future is how are we going to relate to the world and what best promotes our national security interest. Um, so obviously here, uh, Islamic terrorism is a major factor today in these decisions. And, and uh, while we don't really face as many big state actors, and by state actors, I mean countries in terms of uh, waging war, uh, we do relate to countries um, and have to negotiate with them. North Korea is not a friendly country, so we have a, a rocky relationship with them, uh, keeping them in check. China um, and other countries have been accused of waging cyber terrorism, and that, and that really is the new, um, or cyber attacks rather, and that really is the new frontier in foreign policy, is managing um, security threats on in the digital landscape. So let's talk in general about foreign policy, okay? Um, the federal spoke fairly little about foreign policy, but Federalist number eight argues against uh, a standing army. The argue, um, argument that Madison and uh, John Jay make in Federalist number eight is that we don't face here in the United States, we don't face a threat necessarily from other countries. What we face is a uh, fighting within ourselves and among the, the disunited states. And so they're very distrustful of, of standing armies. They believe that small states would array, establish standing armies first in order to protect themselves. And because they would then have armies, then eventually they could possibly overrun. Uh, they would do that for, for protection. And then the larger states would then create an army 
all on their own. Um, and then the larger states would overrun the smaller states. And so th that was the concern there. Um, but in terms of the Constitution, uh, the Constitution, just like uh, every other power of the government, the Constitution divides um, the powers of foreign policy up. Um, the Congress is given certain powers and president is given certain powers. Now, <clears throat> here's the issue with foreign policy. There are several prerequisites to understanding foreign policy and to executing sound foreign policy. Uh, uh, the first of these is knowledge. Um, now, let me back up a second. First of all, we know historically speaking that the president of the United States is the primary role player in foreign policy, and the Constitution supports that. He doesn't have absolute authority. That's why the power or ability to declare war is given to Congress and the power of the purse is given to Congress. But he is the one that makes those connections uh, with other countries. Again, he doesn't have that absolute right. Uh, the Congress has the ability to ratify treaties um, and approve his appointments to various secretaries and various ambassadors. But it is his duty to, to, to take care of that first. Um, so one, he's got to have um, uh, requisites for foreign policy or knowledge. Okay, you gotta, you got to know what's going on in the world. And this is where most Americans falter. Um, there are an, an informed public who have a knowledge of world affairs and what goes on. But this is not general uh, public, John Q. Public. And in order to execute foreign policy well, Teachers, you have to have to that well, that thorough knowledge. Well, um, you also, to, all right, so you also have to have a steady and systematic view of the world. You got to have a consistent view of, um, here's our, here's the American place and, and here's how we're going to execute that view. And that's, that's what that means. You got to have a steady and systematic view. Now, along with that, you have to have an idea of what America is and what America wants. What is our national character? Okay. What do we want out of the world? You have to have an idea of what America is um, and where our place in the world is. And lastly, you have to be able to make decisions and you have to have some sort of secrecy and you have to execute uh, foreign policy. And all of these are believed to be um, characteristics of sound foreign policy, being swift in action, um, uh, being relatively secret if need be in action and execute whatever the action that is. Well, uh, U.S. versus Curtis Wright Export Corporation in 1936 clearly established that um, the president is the key role player in foreign policy. And what happened is um, Congress tried to work around and there was a company that tried to uh, negotiate a, a trade deal uh, with, um, with another country that we had embargo on, had an embargo on. And they were basing it on um, a congressional law, a law that Congress had passed. Well, what was established by this uh, was that, no, they don't, and the president is essentially the leader. He's not the only role player, but he is the leader, and federal government is the leader in, fe in that. Well, in 1947 and 19, um, through 1949, a series of national security acts uh, were passed in preparation for the Cold War uh, that really dramatically changed the way that the U.S., uh, was organized and how we ran foreign policy. And with this uh, were created several departments. Uh, what it did is it created, um, it reorganized the Defense Department and it created the uh, CIA, the National Security Council, and the NEC, um, the National Economic Council. Now, all of these relate to um, foreign policy and they obviously, the Defense Department um, it operates our military, the CIA operates our foreign intelligence agencies, uh, the NSC, National Security Council, advises the president, vice, it's made up of the president, vice president, the, uh, a national security advisor, secretaries of state and defense, um, the CIA director, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Sometimes others are invited. And basically what they do is they advise the president on foreign policy. And they, they work with him and try to help him or her uh, establish a coherent world view and how we relate to the rest of the world. Well, <clears throat> the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and the Departments of State and Defense uh, play a primary role. Now, obviously, the State Department, well, maybe not obviously, the State Department is responsible for um, uh, how we relate to them uh, to foreign countries, not waging war, but how we negotiate and treat them. They are responsible for establishing in embassies in other countries, and they are also establishing for sending special counsels or envoys uh, to other countries to negotiate certain treaties, perhaps, or agreements that we may have, um, or negotiations on certain emergencies we may have with other countries and in other countries. The Defense Department also is obviously a vital role player. They run and control the military. Now, since the Cold War, we, we faced a changing Defense Department. I mentioned a few minutes ago the idea of 
um, cyber attack and cyber warfare. Well, now we've got to um, figure out what is the best use of our military might. Uh, do we need a big, large standing army as we have before, even though we're facing struggles with filling um, our recruitment requirements? Or do we need a more light and mobile task task force? And that's those are decisions based on that, um, based on the def defense department. Uh, last but not least, like the newest uh, group uh, responsible for some sort of foreign policy is the Department of Homeland Security. It was created in 2002 uh, in reaction to the terrorist attacks in 9-11 because it was deemed that we needed more coordination between the FBI, CIA, and other agencies, and we needed to um, be prepared for attacks on our soil, since homeland security. Uh, their job, their duty is to detect foreign um, influence or possible terror attacks, prepare for them, prevent them, uh, uh, protect us, and respond and recover from attacks that occur on U.S. soil. So how, that's all well and good, but how do, is the president checked in foreign policy? This is something that you need to pay attention to and need to look up on uh, a little bit more if you need to in your textbook. Uh, well, first of all, obviously the first and primary check is, uh, is Congress. Uh, leadership. Um, often congressional leadership will criticize the president. Um, and if they presidents do not have his support uh, obvi or their support, obviously that can make things very difficult. And they can often make take the leadership in foreign policy. For example, NASA was created with the understanding of helping to create the technology <clears throat> that would enable us to get to the moon. And that also, that same technology would also enable us to put nuclear weapons in the air to attack the Soviets with. And so that technology, um, and th so they took the lead in that. They also provide oversight. Um, they are responsible, just as we've said before, for, for checking the president and making sure that he's not doing anything wrong. The investigations in Benghazi, that's part of congressional oversight and the possible wrongdoings or alleged wrongdoings, however you may see it, uh, that the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, did at the time and for not responding to that and others for doing what um, for things. They, remember, all have the authority to ratify treaties. We talked today uh, about the Treaty of Versailles and how that was not ratified by the Congress at the time, and so that created some issues. Well, executive agreements are how um, presidents get around that. Executive agreements are agreements between two executives or heads of state in different countries, and but they carry the force of law, just like an executive order does, but they expire when the next president comes in. They have the approval, the ability to approve presidential appointments. Again, so, uh, senators approve all ambassadors. It's their job. Uh, they have that check and limit on power. Okay, and the most powerful thing they have is the power of the purse. They control the purse strings and control how much money the areas, different areas get. And that's, like I said, that's their most powerful weapon because if they do not think that something is a need in foreign policy, uh, the military needs more money, they will withdraw that funds or cut the funding in the following year. In 1973, unhappy about the war in Vietnam, Congress passed the War Powers Act um, and passed it again over President Nixon's veto. So what it does is places a 60-day limit on American troops in a foreign war. So what happens is the president has to uh, notify Congress within 60 days what the troops are doing. Uh, they has to uh, presidents are supposed to consult Congress within 48 hours of hostility, and they've got a 60-day limit um, to, in which to bring them home if Congress tells him to. Uh, they get another 30 days, uh, so they can basically be there for 60 days and another 30 days to fully withdraw those troops. Um, otherwise, president will be in violation of the War Powers Act. Now, the thing is, it's never been invoked. It's never been tested. Uh, but even the threatened threat of using the War Powers Act can, can act pretty strongly and has on, uh, for example, uh, Barack Obama's use of troops. Okay, so the bureaucracy obviously plays an important role um, in limiting the, the federal government's power, or I'm sorry, in checking the federal um, president's power in this, and, and they do what they do best. How do they limit it? Well, sometimes bureaucracy is slow um, and takes a long time. Uh, media. Uh, well, men, a lot of people argue that we think what the media tells us to. And in reality, it's very difficult to understand what's going on in the world without reading newspapers, without um, being aware, without being in places ourselves. And so we simply are only allowed to see what information they're giving us, even more so than 
um, than things in government um, here in the country, current events happening here in the country. Uh, in foreign countries, it's even more difficult. So while we may not necessarily think what they want us to, uh, we may not know um, about situations unless they deem them newsworthy. Uh, the refugee crisis is one that the media largely deem newsworthy as a major event. Uh, different things happening around the world. Uh, lastly, the public. Um, you know, uh, foreign policy is typically not a very important uh, issue to the public in terms of relationship to presidential elections. Uh, most uh, Americans are not terribly well informed uh, about what goes on in the world and the U.S.'s stance or place in it, and so they're not as concerned with what, how we relate to other countries. And so it has a very limited impact um, on foreign policy how or on, on presidents. However, where it does have an impact is if something goes wrong. Uh, two examples of uh, things that have really hurt presidents are, one, uh, the Vietnam War hurt Lyndon B. Johnson, hurt him terribly. American uh, public opinion was very much against the Vietnam War, um, and so that cost him in the election, even though he waged the war on poverty and did many things here in the United States. His foreign policy was not as coherent and was not as successful as many would have liked. Uh, second example of this is Jimmy Carter. Uh, Jimmy Carter had a terrible uh, Iran had the terrible Iran hostage crisis during the election year in 1980, and a lot of people charge and believe that that is one of the major factors, if not the major factor, that led him being defeated by Ronald Reagan as president. And the last example, I told you two, well, I've got three, uh, a last example of a major check or limit on foreign, uh, or sorry, an example of unpopularity of a president and the electoral impact is on George Bush. Um, economy had a greater role um, in the Americans' disdain for them, but the Republicans um, really took a beating in the 2006 elections um, and it was partially due to his handling of things in Iraq and his handling of things in Afghanistan. Well, I hope this video is not too long, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye!